for example, you talk to executives and you say, how do you get smarter on stuff? And they say, normally I don't. I don't have time. I don't invest in myself. The thesis was short, practical books for busy executives. Right? And every single time I put one of these in an executive's hands, they go like this. They go, oh. I might actually read this. What a treat today to be learning from Jeff Gotthelf. He's written four great nonfiction titles. The first two were with top tier traditional publishers, after which he decided he may as well just set up his own publishing business, Sense and Respond Press. They've now published 15 other titles from other authors. He's got a ton of experience on all sides of the industry. And in this chat, we cover all of it. How to de-risk a book? What makes it make good business sense? How do you work with co-authors? What do the numbers on a publishing deal signify? This is a great chat. I learned a lot and I know you're going to love it. I've written four books so far. Lean UX, it's a technical book written by designers, for designers to help them figure out how to do design in an agile software engineering world. And so that was mimicking what I was doing professionally. Sense and Respond was an extension. You could almost call it Lean UX Part 2 to some extent, or more like the manager's guide to Lean UX, if you will. People would read Lean UX and say, this is great. I wish my boss could read this or could have this conversation. And so Sense and Respond was really a response to that saying, let's write a book for the managers. We wrote a business book and we targeted a business book publishing house. We ended up with HBR Press, which was um, really nice. And I can tell you that story as well. The third book, Lean versus Agile versus Design Thinking, is very, very small. It was the experiment to build Sense and Respond Press. It was the test to see what self-publishing was all about. And could we build a viable business on top of it, basically? That was the experiment for that. But that was, again, thematically very similar to the first two books with a very explicit desire to help to use that to drive work. And, and I can tell you that it works. A, a relatively successful book or a couple of relatively successful books drive a lot of work. Now, the interesting thing about Forever Employable is that it is a different book. It draws a lot of the same concepts from the other three books, but the subject matter is completely different. It's not a technical book. It's not a business book necessarily. It's a career book, really. It's a book about how to build a thought leadership business, basically. Like it's semi-autobiographical, semi in the sense that it's not my entire life that's detailed in there, but it's my life from the day I turned 35 up until today, which is 107 years. In Forever Employable, toward the start, you're telling your story and about your decision to write the first book. Something you said that really interested me, when you were deciding to first plant that flag as the foundation for your career, you were deciding between music which you loved and knew a lot about, and design, which you loved and knew a lot about. How do you think about this, especially when it comes to books? What makes a big enough niche or audience? Sizing it is really the key here, right? So if you go too big, it ends up being too generic and nobody really knows what you're about. Say you pick something like project management, right? Project management is way, way too big. You could manage the construction of bridges. You could manage the software projects. You can manage, I don't know, all kinds of projects. I think I had a very similar decision-making uh, process when I was choosing between design and music, especially because I was doing user experience design and it was going to be user experience design in an agile context. So a very specific slice of design in a very specific context. It's not design. Capital D design is an umbrella term for a thousand different things. And, and when you start to look at it, you're kind of like, okay, User experience design for agile teams is a niche that has enough audience in it versus vintage electric pianos. And, you know, there's an audience for vintage electric pianos. There's like 17 nerds out there and, and the audience wasn't sustainable. And I knew that I used to have a collection of vintage electric pianos, like trying to get one of them fixed trying to find somebody who would even look at one. And that's a good indication that there's no audience. <laughs> like if no one's dealing with these devices, right? So it was a sizing exercise. I had a good niche. I knew my team was facing that this particular challenge. I knew there were lots of other teams facing a similar challenge. And so it felt like the right thing to do. What are the big mistakes people are making? Why do so many nonfiction books fail to succeed? The book is a product. And I, I do think you have to think about it that way. I think you have to think about your target reader persona. So who are you writing for? Why would they care about this? It's a competitive analysis portion to every book proposal, which is what else are people reading? Who else is writing about this? And why you? Which is a really good question. It's really fair. Why are you the person to write this story? How is this different than what's already out there? 
And I think that a lot of folks feel like, oh, I'm going to write this about this thing that I love. And it's great. Okay. Like maybe we should check if there aren't 10 other books on this topic and really figure out how you're going to position this as something different. Certainly by the time I wrote Lean UX, Lean UX was first published in 2013. There were no shortage of UX books. There were already some agile UX books out there. Defining it as a unique book was interesting and challenging. And I think doing customer discovery work. For Sense and Respond, we talked to our target audience before we started writing. We wanted to understand what they knew and what they didn't know and what we could help with. We had a target reader persona and we did customer interviews. We went out and we talked to these folks to make sure that our hypothesis held water to some extent, because why do it otherwise? Or why do it in, in this way that we were planning? So then your question was, why do so many nonfiction books end up not selling? I have a perspective on it now from both sides, from the writing side and from the publishing side. And the bottom line, it's books don't sell because authors don't market their books. That's it. Your publisher is going to invest a little bit of money in you. If they lose that $10,000 advance, okay, no big deal. So they'll make it up some other way. If they, if they gave you a half a million dollar advance, yeah, they're going to promote that book. But a, a $10,000 advance, it's on you. They'll take a little bit of money and they'll sprinkle it on a hundred different authors. And they know full well that half those authors are never going to even finish the manuscript. It's up to you to sell your books. It's up to you to keep pushing those books. I have the benefit of having published 15 books. And I can tell you that five out of those 15 books sell. And the five books that sell are by the five authors who have a presence, who are in the conversation, who are, for lack of a better phrase, promoting themselves. They're engaging in discourse. They are actively marketing their books. They did a lot of buildup to the launch of their books, which is, by the way, Forever Employable is the first time I really ever did that. And then they maintain their presence and they keep pushing the book and they keep pushing the book. There's so many books. There's so much noise. It's in your court to make your book successful. You've got to make the effort really to push forward, to figure out ways to get books into people's hands and, and to get them out there. And, and frankly, I think that generally speaking, the goal is just to get copies into people's hands. That's the thing that I care about the most. Every now and again, one of us gets very lucky, but generally speaking, none of us are going to be living off the royalties off of our nonfiction books. We're going to be living off the opportunities that those books generate. If you believe that, or if you buy into that, then the goal isn't so much how much money am I making off of the book or each book? It's how many hands can I get the book into? I, and, I, and I'll say one more thing and then I'll pause for a bit because I've said a lot of stuff. I self-published Forever Employable with KDP, with Amazon. And every now and again, KDP will send an email and say, hey, we've identified your book for a sale. If you'd like your book to participate in this sale, just accept, say yes. And Forever Employable was on sale in January in the UK, Germany, and France for a buck. We sold 2,500 copies in a month, which is massive. That's a, it's bigger than our first month back when we first launched. I was thrilled, I was thrilled with those numbers. I make significantly less money per book if they're selling them for a dollar, but 2,500 more people have that book. And then 2,500 more people have a circle of friends who they tell about that book, right? And so this is the, the goal for me is always to get as many copies in the people's hands as possible. No one can recommend it if no one knows it exists. For me, the line in the sand I draw is I want to reach a thousand perfect readers before I take my foot off the gas. And yeah. once I've got that thousand, it's like, okay, now the launch is over. Now I can like decide if I want to maintain it or not. One small question on a kind of on the softer side, you know, you've been writing book for nearly 10 years now. How does this fit into your life? What's changed with it? How do you do this? Lean UX was a real struggle. I wrote the manuscript three times. O'Reilly rejected the manuscript three times. I brought in a couple of extra editors to try to get it over the finish line. It didn't work. And then I finally got it. We got it over the finish line in three months when Josh Seiden joined the project. And Josh Seiden and I worked together and he knew the material the forwards and backwards and he was a good writer. And that's kicked off a business partnership, a friendship that's lasted a decade at this point. Sense and Respond, we started together, Josh and I, from the beginning. And that was, and again, look, you're fitting it in the cracks, right? I was working full time when we were writing Lean UX. Sense and Respond was happening uh, right when I became self-employed. So I was writing basically on airplanes, on trains, in hotel rooms, in foreign cities. But Josh and I, Google Docs, 
nothing fancy. The, the really interesting process and the thing that I learned a ton from was Forever Employable because I used a ghostwriter. I really wanted to write this book, but I also knew that I, I was really busy. I was traveling 50% of the time. There was no way I was going to pull it off in any reasonable amount of time. And so I worked with a ghostwriter named Peter Economy. He's been a business writer. He writes for Forbes Weekly. He's been a business writer forever. He's ghostwritten dozens and dozens of books, lots of books in this space, in the technical agile design space. And the way that I worked with him was we wrote out a table of contents and we agreed. We kind of massaged it a bit, he and I, and then he would interview me about every section in the table of contents like this via zoom because he's in California and we, we would record it and he would send it out for transcription. And then he would use the transcription as the base for each section. And then he would massage it into narrative that actually was well-written and makes sense. And then he would send it to me for reviews. I would send edits, we'd go back and forth, and then we move on to the next thing. The benefit of this, obviously, is that the initial writing was on Peter, although the editing was heavily on me as well. But the ultimate benefit in this for me personally is that I hear my voice in a way that I had never heard it in the other books that I've written. It turns out when I start writing, especially technical books, I, I lose a bit of my personality in the writing. I get kind of serious in, in the writing, which is not me. I like to think I'm a funny guy, lighthearted, certainly. And the, the thing I love about Forever Employable is when I read it, I hear me because I spoke this. I didn't write it. I was just chatting with Peter about these ideas. And so the phrases that I say, the phrases that I normally use, they're in the book. And when it was all said and done, I read the thing for the first time, start to finish. I was like, wow, this really sounds like me. And that was cool. Jeff, I was just curious when you're doing sort of your customer interviews, especially for Sense and Respond, for example, how did you find the people you were speaking with if they weren't direct contacts? And then also, what, what did you ask them? Finding people is not that hard. You create that target reader persona, and, and then you go to LinkedIn, for example, <clears throat> and search for these kinds of people and just reach out, cold call, offer them something for their time. It doesn't have to be a lot. If you're going to talk to, to 10 people, you could offer them 50 bucks each and end up spending 500 bucks on a ton of great in insight, which is worth every penny, in my opinion, to write a better book. And then what do you ask them? You say things like, where do you normally read? What topics do you care about? Where do you normally get smarter about these topics? Have you read any books about this topic recently? Which ones did you like? Why did you like it? Which ones didn't you like? What didn't you like about this or that or that source? And you're really trying to get a sense of what they're looking for, how they normally find it, and what gets in the way of them getting smarter or consuming it for Sense and Respond Press, a tiny little book. The thesis was short, practical books for busy executives, right? That's the elevator pitch. And every single time I put one of these in an executive's hands, they go like this, they go, oh, I might actually read this. And that's phenomenally validating. And that was universally the first response because it wasn't 250 pages long. And because, and look, we're designers. One of the things that we tried to do, I don't know if you can see it kind of right there. It talks about how long it takes to read the book. So it just sets an expectation about that as well. And, and you learn a ton. You learn a ton just by simply reaching out and asking people about these ideas. For example, you talk to executives and you say, how do you get smarter on stuff? And they say, normally I don't. I don't have time. I don't invest in myself. Maybe I'll buy a book, but I won't read it. Some of them listen to podcasts, but they certainly don't go to conferences or trainings or anything along those lines. It's fascinating. There's a real untapped opportunity to figure out how to provide content to executives because they do not invest in themselves right now. Do you have your authors do a similar sort of fact-finding mission on their subject matter? It's a good idea. And I think if I was going to start a press today, I would start a press that says, look, you have to prove to me that there's an audience for this content, just simply because I'm sitting on 10 books that don't sell. I, I want you to prove to me that there's an audience that will, will buy and will continue to buy this. Look, these days, when we receive a new submission, the general response is, go write three short pieces about this and post them on Medium and let's see what happens. And then come back to us with feedback from the market about this concept. So we're becoming, we're leaning in that direction, but we haven't asked people to do that. Generally speaking, it's been 
from our experience, this feels like a relevant topic for our portfolio of topics. What are the marketing approaches that you've seen work or that you've seen be sustainable? The best-selling book of the four that I've written is Lean UX. In fact, we're writing the third edition of it right now. The fact that there's still demand for that means that we found a kind of an evergreen challenge in business or a very long-term problem in business. I think one thing is, okay, are you taking on sort of the flavor of the moment? And, and look, and there's room for that, right? There's room for like, you know, looks into the Trump White House when everything's a disaster and you're trying to figure out what's going on. And there's room for, for striking while that iron is hot. But as far as long-term stuff, you're looking to solve problems for people that they're going to have for a long time. In fact, um, I talk about it in Forever Employable, right? It, it's Bezos gets asked all the time, what's going to change in five years? And Bezos always says, look, I'm, I don't think about it that way. I think about what's not going to change in the next 10 to 20 years. And I build my business around those needs. I think similarly, it's about picking an evergreen topic, number one. I think number two, it's about maintaining the conversation about this thing. So this is work. It's maintaining activity and a presence in the conversation. And I think that the more that you do that, the more evergreen your book becomes. Now, you can lengthen the runway for the book by helping put on book clubs. Like people still do Lean UX book club. It always surprises me to no end because the first edition was published in March of 13. The second edition was published in 2016. So it's been five years since there was a new Lean UX and there'll be another one later this year. And people are still doing Lean UX book clubs. And so really trying to, to push, and there's all kinds of organizations that help this kind of stuff happen. So I think that goes a long way. Continuing to, to, to push the conversation forward is critical to the, to the book becoming evergreen, but that's a ton of effort on an author's part. You talked about writing Lean UX with a co-author and with a ghostwriter. Is that something that just varies depending on the book or is it something you think can make a better book to have co-author or co-writer? Yeah. So Lean UX was just Josh Sodden and myself. And look, we're super lucky. No <laughs> doubt about it. Josh and I get along very well. Our personalities complement each other. He's deliberate and methodical and slow. And I am, let's jump out the window and we'll figure out how to land along the way. And so I speed him up and he slows me down. And it's a good, it's a healthy tension with the ghostwriter and Forever Employable, which is the most recent book. That was my story. For me, it was a timing thing. So the ghostwriter was the answer to getting this book done in a reasonable amount of time. It was about a year start to finish, which is very fast compared to all the other books that I've done. And I knew Peter's work he had worked with several of my friends and other authors who I'd known. I knew it was great. So it was, as long as I could afford him, it was a no brainer. And, and look, and I think there's a real risk here right around, well, how much did you contribute versus how much did I contribute? Should I really put your name on the cover? Whose name should go first kind of thing? I contributed more than you. You should, yeah. you should go in, you should go in eyes open to these things. You need to have the uncomfortable conversation up front. And, and maybe even get it, get everything in writing to some extent, just so that in the event it goes south, you've planned for this. If I want out, how do I get out? And then what happens to my contribution, right? Like that, those, you should absolutely have those conversations up front. How do you go about planting a flag? And when is the right time to write a book within that journey yeah. overall? And in Forever Employable, I talk about this very specifically. I take everything that I've learned from digital product development, which is my day job, and I've applied it to building a content business, which is what I have today. And, and the thinking there is, look, as Rob just said, writing a book is a long, slow grind. It's a significant investment of time, emotion, money, and you don't want to do that in my opinion, until you have proof that there's a market for this content. So you want to build evidence that gives you the confidence to say, yeah, I'm going to invest the next 18 months of my life or two years of my life to bring this project to light. 
you want evidence that says, yes, people will buy this. Yes, there's a demand for this. And you collect that evidence by running smaller scale experiments in a similar direction. So for example, I mentioned it a few minutes ago, but when we get a submission from, from an author, the first thing we say is go write three 500 word pieces about this topic on Medium, right? Yeah. That is a significantly lighter weight experiment than writing a book and hoping it sells. And I'll help you amplify it, whatever it is, but let's see what people say, if anything, about this. Let's see what kind of feedback we get. Put a webinar about the topic, put together 15 slides and see if you can, if people will sign up and listen to you talk about it, right? All of these things are significantly smaller investments than writing a book. And so you want to do a series of these things that eventually build up a body of evidence that say, you know what? There's a market for this. Every time I talk about this, there's a reaction on Twitter or on LinkedIn. It seems to be endless conversations about this. And again, I, th I think a book is a big risk because it's a big investment. You should build the evidence for it. Like For example, Forever Employable was something I've been thinking about. The evidence that I got for it was I was getting weekly inbound messages from people asking me questions. How did you build your business? How did you write a book? How did you get a book deal? How did you get that speaking gig? That type of thing. And when you get those multiple times per week for yeah. two years, three years, four years, to me, that's enough signal to say there's something here. I chose to go out there with a book, but test your way to the okay. confidence level. How would you feel about giving all of your book content away in advance in form of webinars, uh, blog posts, everything, would that book still be useful then? Yes, I feel fine with that. Dave Gray did that with Liminal Thinking. He wrote the whole thing in public on Medium. He wrote literally every chapter on Medium in public, solicited advice, put groups together to give him feedback and wrote it in public. Book still sold, it's a good book. Dave's a good writer, he's a smart guy. So I definitely think that it's perfectly okay. No, no one's going to go out there and be like, wait, I'll probably put this book out. But if I go run a Google search and then <laughs> download and collate all his blog posts and webinars and print them out, like, no, I'm just going to buy the book. My most upvoted review on Amazon is someone saying that they pirated my book and then <laughs> a chapter in, they realized it was so valuable that they felt bad. And so they went onto Amazon and bought a real copy. There you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think in... At the moment, I, I haven't fully formed my ideas about this, but we have to accept that like the book or the content is going to get pirated. If a yeah. book gets sufficiently popular, people will even go and scan it page by page yeah. and then print out their own terrible reproduction. Sometimes they even try to sell them through Amazon, which is pretty annoying. And so the way I've come around to it is you want the book to be a valuable marketing piece, right? Lead with value, teach, deliver what you promised on the cover. Absolutely. That's priority number one. But then also what else does it enable? In the case of the mom test, I don't have a backend business that I'm trying to upsell people to. I don't do consulting. It's, there's, no, there's nothing else. But the book itself is marketing for the book. And since it's built to grow through recommendations, if someone pirates it, they're still helping me to sell it to people who won't pirate it. Right. And, and so that's valuable. And but if, you've, if you're building a business, if this is the cornerstone of your business, like Jeff has been doing, then the book is the least of your revenue. And if someone yeah. pirates it, hooray, that's free advertising. Quick question. Lately, I've seen uh, multiple pretty serious people advocating that validation has no point. And uh, that if you do things like put a few blog posts on Medium, uh, that it still isn't a guarantee that stuff will work. Ergo, uh, validation uh, serves no, no use. And it, it's the argument. So a couple of thoughts. I have two reactions. One, one, I've built my entire career on this thesis. So if it's not true, <laughs> I've got a big fall coming at some point. But that yeah. said, look, yeah, you, look, you're not guaranteeing it. Right. But, so I agree with that comment, but you are de-risking the book. Yes. Right. Yeah. You're not de-risking it a hundred percent to do. This is a sure shot. Again, unless your last name is Kardashian or Winfrey or Clinton or even Trump at this point, but you're de-risking the book. And, and what you're de-risking is that nobody will buy it. You're proving that there's an audience, that there's a market. And at the same time, you're building demand for the book. So look, I told you it took me three, four times to write the, the initial manuscript that O'Reilly actually accepted for Lean UX. It took me two years. Over the course of those two years, I talked about the fact that I was writing this book so that when it came out, everybody's like, I can't wait for this book. You've been talking about it forever. Shut up and publish this book. 
you're de-risking the book and you're building demand. You, you can't guarantee it, but you're proving to yourself that this is a worthwhile use of your time. And as you know, and as we've talked about, even in the, in the time we've talked today, it's a, it's a big commitment. It's massive. I'm also curious to hear if there's anything that you've done a complete 180 on over the last, say, five years or maybe 10 years, something that you have firmly believed and now you think is uh, completely like the opposite. That's a good question. 180. I'm trying to think about these books. Oh, 180. Okay. I'll tell you this. So the thesis for Sense and Respond Press, I told you, was short, practical books for busy executives with the initial assumption being that a short book would be easier to write. Nope. Nope. Did a 180 degrees on that. Because one, one of the things we wanted to do was open up an opportunity for people to write their first book. Let's say you get a business book or a tech book publishing deal for your first book. They're going to want 300 pages. That's not an insignificant amount of writing. It's 50,000, 60,000 words. It's a lot. If you've only written thousand word medium pieces up until then, 60,000 is it's Mount Everest, right? It feels impossible to climb sometimes. So we thought, hey, 10,000 words, 10 to 12,000 words should be easy. And people would be able to get those kinds of manuscripts done faster. And we could turn around the books more quickly because we're print on demand, blah, blah, blah. We templated the whole thing. Nope. Getting people to focus on a single topic or two maximum in 10 to 12,000 words is super difficult. And turning around those kinds of manuscripts that are good and worth publishing has taken significantly longer than we ever anticipated. We really thought people could turn these around in three months, six months minimum to get anything out of them. And then it's usually another potentially two to three months to get it to a place where we'll actually publish it. Yeah, it's hard to boil it down. And also it seems like we, we emotionally only ever feel what we're leaving out. And so we're thinking of all the questions we didn't answer, all the readers we didn't write to. For some reason, that's what hurts us. But it's yeah. funny, right? Because I, I don't know what the price points for the Sense and Respond books are, but we were just talking to Alex Hillman last week and his book, it can't even be 5,000 words. And he charges $20 for it because he's like, yeah, it's valuable, right? Yeah. Like it saves you time. That's valuable too. I should charge you double because it's short. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so since there's, look, I'm a firm believer that Picasso fable where uh, a woman comes up to Picasso on the street and she's like, oh my God, it's you, the famous artist. And he says, yes, it's me. And he, she says, draw me. And she says, oh, he says, okay, madam. In like 15 minutes, he just sketches this thing and he hands it to her and he goes, that'll be $5,000. And she goes, but you only worked on it for 15 minutes. He's like, it's taken me a lifetime of learning to be able to do that in 15 minutes. And that's worth $5,000. I mean, for the record, that would have been the best invested $5,000 of all time. Of if course. She, uh, actually took him up on it. Of course. <laughs> I was wondering if there was one lesson that you would pull out from Forever Employable that you think would be valuable. The biggest lesson is I got infinitely better at storytelling about the content that I teach by doing the teaching. So I think if you have an opportunity to teach the material that you're writing about, and by teaching, I mean any opportunity to tell your story in front of live people. So whether it's giving a talk or doing an, a Q&A like this or teaching a workshop or, or putting on a webinar or whatever it is, any opportunity you have to teach to tell your story in a capacity where you have to explain it to other people makes you an infinitely better storyteller. One of the, the most unexpected and best compliments I've ever gotten for my work, my day job of teaching and training in organizations. I did a, a workshop back in 2019 at EA Sports out in Los Angeles in California. And I taught a one-day workshop about lean UX kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, this, the woman who hired me came up to me and she said, Jeff, that was great. All the concepts that you taught, I already knew the concepts, but what you gave me was a, a clear vocabulary to use. You gave me a language to use that I can now take that and, and make a more compelling case for this way of working inside the company. I have that language because I've been teaching this for 10 years. And so every opportunity that you have to teach, you sharpen your storytelling, uh, you sharpen your vocabulary and, and the language of telling that particular story that you're sharing, and it's better. 
so that's to me that's the biggest lesson is teaching really is, is the way to really sharpen your focus and agree more and where can we learn from you everything of mine is on my website it's jeffgodhealth.com obviously I, I do product and design stuff but then i'm also teaching forever employable stuff i'm halfway through the first cohort of the becoming forever employable workshop it, and essentially it's a 10-week course based on the book and i'm taking people through this process on a weekly basis these experiments that I talked about with Harpal, that is exactly what we're doing. We're shipping ex content experiments every week to plant our flag, validate the flag or de-risk the flag, and then start to build a platform around that so that when you've got enough evidence to write that book or to launch that book, you're launching it on top of a platform and people who are eager and waiting for that content. We are at the end of the hour and I don't want to hold you late, but let me just say thank you so much, Jeff. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I, I'm so grateful that you came to share your wisdom and your experiences. It's my pleasure, Rob. It's a pleasure, pleasure to meet everybody here. Folks, have a great weekend and thanks so much for having me, Rob. I'll see you all next time. It's up to you to sell your books.